test, test. Is it working? All right. We were out of juice. I invite you to turn with me to the book of Matthew. Matthew. Matthew chapter 6. Last month, we as elders, uh, we, we finalized as best we could the preaching schedule. And one of the things that we identified as an area that we want to grow in as a body is this uh, area of prayer. And so before we give ourselves to our normal habit of going through a book at a time, verse by verse, we want to be able to take the beginning of 2023 uh, to preach on a need in this congregation. One of those things is prayer. And so this morning, and Lord willing, next week, We'll give us a, we're going to give ourselves to that topic. Still going to preach expositionally through a passage, but not, we're not looking at the entire book of Matthew. We'll go to Second Peter here in a few weeks, but for this Lord's Day and Lord willing next, we'll give ourselves the topic of prayer. So to that end, Matthew chapter 6, we're going to be focusing on verses 5 through 8, but uh, just to establish some context, we're going to begin in verse 1 this morning. Does that sound good? All right, I'm looking forward to this with you, brothers and sisters. So let's stand together in honor of God's word being read. God's word says this. Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. So when you give to the poor... Do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets so that they may be honored by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving will be in secret and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. When you pray, you're not to be like the hypocrites for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray together. Father, what we do not know this morning, I ask that in your great kindness to us, you teach us. Um, What we are not as a people, but should be because of the love of Christ within us. Would you please, by your grace, make us. Father, help us now. We can labor and labor and labor, and yet if you are not in the building, we labor in vain. We are absolutely desperate for you to come now and through the power of your word preached and inwardly digested, would you please transform us by the renewing of our minds for your glory's sake and the absolute joy of your people. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Not many days ago, my oldest daughter was uh, walking up the steps with me on our way to bed, and uh, as we were walking up the steps, uh, we were talking, some of the most precious moments, right right before sleep when it's just Abigail and I, and um, Annie's uh, stomach had been hurting her. In fact, she'd been sick, and so she was asking me about Ann's stomach, and I said, yeah, she's just not feeling very well. And she stopped on the stairs, looked at me very seriously, holding my hand. It was very, very precious. And she simply said with great earnestness, um, Daddy, we need to pray for Annie. We need to pray for Annie. And we did that right, right then and there together that God would heal Annie's tummy. And it was really sweet because the next day, you know, she was fine. And uh, it was sweet to be able to talk to my daughter about how God answers prayer. But if... 
I, I share that story because if prayer mattered that much to my own daughter who is not yet converted, then, beloved, should prayer not matter so much more to us individually and corporately as the people of God? I think so. And so the question that we want to ask this morning in this two-part sermon series on prayer is simply this. Prayer, why? Why should you pray? Why should it matter to you? Does it matter to God? What are the motivations for praying as the people of God in Christ? And so in this passage, God, in his great kindness to all of us, gives us three clear motivations. Three clear motivations, at least three, in this passage for why prayer matters, why we should pray, why prayer should be precious to you. So first, our first the first motivation that God gives us in Matthew chapter 6 is prayer matters because it's evidence of regeneration. Prayer matters because it matters to God. It's, it's evidence that the new birth has taken place within you. It matters, again I'm going to say this really clearly, it matters because it matters to God. I want you to notice in verse 1. Verse 1 is connected essentially with verse 5. So if you look in verse 1, what does verse 1 tell you? Beware of practicing your righteousness. That's how it begins. And then Jesus lists these things that you do to practice righteousness. The issue isn't practicing righteousness. It's practicing righteousness that you might be known by men. So notice in verse 5 then, that's part of what verse 1 is talking about. Jesus begins first with, in verses 1 through 4, the first element of practicing righteousness is giving. Right? Pastor Dave talked about this just last, last Sunday. He did a wonderful job of, of, of showing us in the scriptures when a life is transformed by the regenerating work of Jesus, when you repent and believe in Christ, Christ changes you. And he changes you to such a degree that you desire earnestly to do what is right. That's righteousness. You do what your heavenly Father has asked you to do, not to earn his favor, but because you have his favor in Jesus. And so as a person regenerated, you want to give. You want to give sacrificially. You want to do as Martin Luther said. You, you are given fingers without webs so you can see money pass through them. I didn't make it up. And that's what Dave talked about last week. That's part of practicing righteousness. And yet, we don't want to do this to gain the approval of others. We don't want to do this to get them to look at us. That's what Jesus is talking about here. That in the first four verses, that is one way to practice righteousness. So when he gets to verse five, when you pray, this is simply another element of what it means to practice righteousness. A.K.A. what it means to be obedient. What it means to be obedient. So, <clears throat> think about this for just a second. God in Christ takes your sin away from you. It's called expiation. A little theological training here. Expiation. It's like uh, when someone, when your money in your bank account gets transferred out of your account into someone else's. That's called expiation, right? Jesus, he imputes imputation. He takes his righteousness and gives it to your account. This all happens in the gospel when you believe upon Christ. Your sin expiated onto Jesus, and Jesus' righteousness imputed to your account. Your bad money in your bank account, out, and his good money in his bank account, into yours. It's the most wonderful transaction of all time. It's called the great exchange. And anybody, anybody who has got that exchange going on in their life is forever changed. It's not like a one-time transfer. You know when you type in your... Um, if you get like a, you know, you want to transfer between accounts, you can do like a reoccurring or a, you know, one-time transfer. It's not just on a daily basis. It's not just on a every once in a while basis that you get the righteousness of Christ. It is second by second, millisecond by millisecond, the righteousness of Christ is yours. 
So there is never a moment in your life if you belong to Jesus where you cannot look at God the Father and Him look at you and there be anything but pure righteousness that He sees. You cannot tarnish a righteousness that is not actually yours but is given to you. It's always Christ's. That's really good news for sinners. It's really good news. So when you read in verse one of chapter six, practicing your righteousness. If you're a true child of God, you say, of course, of course, I have the very righteousness of Jesus. Always, forever, and I want it to just seep out. So in these verses, just so we're clear, it's not Jesus teaching legalism. It's not Jesus saying we must practice righteousness to earn salvation. This is simply Jesus saying, If you've been changed by the grace of God in Christ, this is what it looks like to practice righteousness wrongly and rightly. And one of the ways we practice righteousness, one of the ways we evidence we've been regenerated, we've been saved, is by prayer. We pray. We pray. And we see here, because it's a part of practicing righteousness, that it matters to God. So I just want to say this very, very plainly. When you're regenerated, the first thing that happens is the things that became fo- the, the, the things that used to be foolish to you now become precious. The very things that used to be precious to you become more and more foolish to you, which is great news. It's called sanctification. It follows justification. And so when you read in his word that these things matter to God, they begin to matter to you because you've been born again. So prayer here, if you look in verse 1 and in verse 5, Prayer absolutely matters to God. He is telling you how to do it and how not to do it. This matters to God. Therefore, prayer matters to you because it matters to Him. It's an evidence of regeneration. Now, that's fundamental, but we have to start there because that's where Jesus starts. Beware of practicing your righteousness. Prayer matters to God, and so it must matter to you. Number two, prayer matters because God will reward you. So not only is it evidence that you've been born again, prayer matters because God will reward you. Look in verse 6. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who's in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. It's right there in the text. Now, we're going to talk about how we are to pray next week. This morning, though, we're talking about why. We're going to talk about the how, Lord willing, next Sunday. But this morning, we're simply asking, why should you pray? And one of the plain reasons that Jesus gives you, brothers and sisters, is this. He's going to reward you. Now, remember, number one, if God has saved you, He changes everything within you from the inside out. Right, so for instance, uh, before you were saved, you might have viewed prayer as a way to impress God, perhaps, or maybe a way to curry favor with Him, and you know, with all your great words of eloquence and all the many ways, the plethora of words that spewed forth from your um, lips. Maybe that was a way to impress God, and and if not to impress God, at the very least, you viewed prayer as a way to impress others. Way to impress those around you. But when God Almighty gets a hold of you, when God comes in, everything about prayer changes. God changes the way you view prayer when He saves you. It builds on number one. When He regenerates you, the way you view prayer stops being about impressing God or impressing others. It stops. And the reason it stops The reason prayer stops being a way to impress God is because when you belong to God in Christ, you realize you can't do anything to impress Him. Everything good that you do comes from Him and His work in you in the Holy Spirit. Anything you do that's good comes from Him. Everything good comes from Him. So instead of prayer being a way to impress God, Prayer, when you're regenerated, when you're born again, instead of becoming a way to impress God, prayer becomes a way for God, for for you to communicate with God about how impressive God is to you. That's what prayer is. 
Prayer becomes a way to be amazed at God and not yourself. It changes everything about prayer. Prayer stops being a way to justify yourself because you know the only way to justification is through the Son, Jesus Christ. And so instead of prayer becoming a way to justify yourself, if I just say enough right words, if I just appeal enough to God, uh, He'll save me. Instead of prayer being that way, prayer instead becomes, for the Christian, a way to thank God for what He's already done in you. A way to glory in this God who has done such a gracious thing in rescuing you from damnation, from the power and penalty of your sin. So I want to say it one more time. Instead of prayer becoming a way to curry favor with God, it becomes a way to recognize that the only reason you have any favor with God in the first place is because of what Jesus has done. And indeed, in Jesus, you actually have the very pleasure of God. I want to just let this soak in for just a second. As you, you think about why prayer, how to view prayer. In Christ, God is pleased with you. You have the pleasure of God. You don't need prayer to earn that pleasure for you. That's what true biblical prayer is. That's what prayer becomes for the Christian. You recognize that in Christ, God the Father is pleased with you. He's pleased with you, and you experience that when you commune with Him in prayer. That's what you experience. The pleasure of God. As you commune with God the Father, you feel His pleasure. You know His pleasure. That's your reward. Assurance. You, you go to God in communion, you experience, assur- you experience assurance, hope, confidence, peace. Beloved, your reward is knowing more of Him. Your reward is being eternally transformed and daily fed by Him. Your reward is Him. That's what that word reward is contrasted with. Okay, just think about that. Okay, if you're wondering, well, is that really what the reward is, more of God? Well, just think about what Jesus is doing in this passage here. What's He contrasting the word reward with? Right? He's comparing the reward from your Father in heaven with the reward that you get from others when you pray to experience the pleasure that comes from them. From them hearing you. From them um, praising you. From them noticing you. You got the reward from your Heavenly Father in contrast to the pleasure of being liked by men. So this is what Jesus is saying. If you were to pray in the way that honored God, that pleased God, you'd experience the very pleasures of God rather than the pleasures of men. You can have one or the other, friends. Hear this. You can have the smile of Almighty God. Or you can have the weak, finite smile of men. You can have the smile of Almighty, infinite Jehovah Or you can have the smile of weak, finite, depraved. Which one you want? That's what Jesus is saying. You can have the temporary approval of all your peers. And you can experience being liked by all those around you. And I know the temptation of wanting to be liked. That's what Jesus is talking about here. You can have the temporary approval of all your peers. Or you can have the eternal approval of God. So in in praying the way that God prescribes, you are rewarded with the very approval, the very smile, the very pleasure of God. That's what he's contrasting it with here. So if you're not a Christian this morning, maybe you read verse 6 and said, oh, reward. And then you just heard what I just said, that you get more of God, that's your reward, and you say, what kind of reward is that? That would make sense if you were not a believer. That might be the case in some of our hearts this morning. You heard reward and you immediately started thinking about everything else but God. 
But if you're a Christian, if you're a Christian, you get that. You get it. You say, yes. My reward is more of God? Yes! I long for more of Christ. I long to know Him more. I long to treasure Him more. I long to cherish Him more. And wonder of wonders, that's exactly what Jesus gives you in prayer, in Him, more of Himself. I would urge you, if you don't know Christ as Lord and Savior, but um, perhaps for the first time this morning as you as you heard from the prophet Isaiah, talking about um, Jesus being crushed for your iniquities, and then we sang that song, stricken, smitten, and afflicted, and now you're hearing from Pastor Grant that there is a way for your sin to be Christ's, and for Christ's righteousness to be yours, forever right with God, standing with Him justified, forever and ever, for perhaps for the first time, you're hearing that, and you're saying, I want that, I desire that, I want the reward that is more of Jesus, And I would urge you this morning, cry out to God. And for the first time in your life, you truly would pray. You'd you'd, you'd pray in a biblical way. Dead people in their sins, they don't know that they desperately need a Savior. And so if you, this morning, thinking about prayer, I, I am desperate. That is not consistent with deadness. If you know you are desperate for Jesus, cry out to Him and you'd truly pray this morning. Cry out to Him to be your Savior. Cry out to Him that He, Him and His finished work on the cross is all that your hope can be. And it will prove that He's done the miracle of regeneration in you. What a reward that would be, huh? So friends, if that's you today, I encourage you, cry out to Him and He will reward you. He will reward you. He'll give you more of himself. He's already given himself to you, hasn't he? He loved you and gave himself for you. Cry out to God to save you on the merits of the Son. And he'll do that. You'll be saved. And just think about that as you think about um, what Jesus says. Your Father who's in secret, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Um, I need you to look at that both sides, right? He he sees um, when you pray, in secret, when you're, you're not praying to gain the approval of others, you're not praying to impress others. He sees that. But you know what else he sees? He sees all the darkest secrets too. And here Jesus offers you to say, um, cry out to him, to the God, God the Father, who hears and knows all of your deepest and darkest secrets and yet is offering you salvation in his Son. And he will reward you with himself. Everlasting life in his son. Don't mean to always talk about my daughters, but it's so fun. Um, if you would let me share another story about them. Two weeks ago, um, it might have been three weeks ago now. When was Christmas Eve? Two weeks ago? A few weeks ago, um, my, I took my oldest two daughters with me here uh, on Christmas Eve. So you saw them I, if you were here. And um, the reason it was just me and them is because my wife was sick and so she stayed home with uh, Emmy and Ellie and uh, so as we pulled out uh, I got my my oldest two children buckled in and we pulled out of the driveway and getting ready to head to the church building and uh, again Abigail pipes up hey where where's where'd mommy go oh, so mom, mommy's sick she's gonna have to stay at uh, at, at home and she can't come to the church gathering with us and and my little sweet girl she said uh I mean, this is just really sweet, uh, amazing. She, she said, okay, well, can, can we pray for mommy, right? Yeah, and uh, just like she did with Annie, and, 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 and so we did. But this is, this is the cool part. So we, we prayed for mommy as we were pulling out of the driveway. And, and I just really thrilled by it. I looked in the rearview mirror, and I said, that was so sweet that you wanted to pray for mommy. And this is, this is so wonderful. Um, she said this line. She goes, I love to pray for mommy. And then she said um, something that cut me, like, cut me pretty, pretty good. She said, uh, it's really fun. It's really fun to pray. And, uh, you know, you just think about that. It's fun to pray. You just think about the, the, the prize, the benefit, the reward that each of you Christians have 
in Jesus Christ, that you can stand before the throne room of God Almighty, the Father, and plead with Him the joy that is to be yours in prayer, the fun that can be yours in the Son. Do you view it like that? Like a little three-year-old would view prayer? Fun. I mean, what do the Scriptures say, right? Philippians 2.13, God is at work in you for His good what? Pleasure. Pleasure. He's at work in you for His good pleasure that you too might know the very pleasures of God. I mean, what a reason to pray. To know more intimately the very pleasures of Almighty God. He's the one who the Scripture says there is pleasures forevermore at His right hand. And you can go to Him. That's fun. That's fun. Or Psalm 37, 4, you know this one. Delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. And and so what happens? If your heart's been liberated by Jesus, that's your reward. You get more of a delight in Him. That's your desire. I want to know Him more. I mean, why wouldn't we want to pray, brothers and sisters? We don't need this list. (laughs) We don't need a third, but we're going to get a third. But Why wouldn't you want to pray? Prayer matters, number one, because if you're born again, you desire to be obedient. That's number one. And Jesus teaches here that uh, prayer is obedience. And then number two, prayer matters because for the Christian, your greatest delight is in Christ. And if you pray God's way, you simply get more of your greatest delight, more of Jesus. And now, finally, number three. Prayer matters because you desperately need God. Prayer matters because you desperately need God. And here's the wonder of wonders, okay? You desperately need God, and He promises to help you. I want you to look in verses 7 and 8. Look in verses 7 and 8. When you are... And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Okay, what's He saying there? Jesus is saying, very plainly, don't be like the repetitive Gentiles. Don't be like the lost. They think that if they just pester enough, they just nag their false gods, little g-gods, and they just annoy their false gods enough, it will annoy them into getting what they want. And which makes you think of Elijah. At least I did. Elijah and prophets of Baal, right? Mount Carmel, a whole bunch of dudes doing all kinds of pomp and circumstance around their little altar so that Baal would come and bring fire and... Suck up the sacrifice. I mean, crying out, cutting themselves, wailing, moaning. I mean, man, it must have been a commotion. Repetition, repetition, repetition. Kept kept going, kept going. And in contrast in that story, you got Elijah. What What does he do? Not to mention he pours water all around it multiple times, but he offers a simple and yet direct prayer to Almighty God, the Lord, the one true God, the one true living God. Simple, one time, boom, God comes. God shows up. Jesus is saying, do not be like the prophets of Baal. Don't be like them. For your Father knows what you need before you even ask Him. Just think, stay with me here, it's the, the, my favorite part of the passage is that verse. Just think about what Jesus has been doing here. He's been contrasting. So I want you to look again, we've already looked there, but let me just show you how he's been contrasting. Verse 5, when you pray, you're not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners, that they may be seen by men. Truly I say to you, they have the reward in full. 
But you, contrast, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, pray to your Father who's in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So what's Jesus telling them there in that contrast? We've already said it. God is saying you can have the pleasure of being known by men or you can have the pleasure of being known by me. Pick. And now in verses 7 and 8, he does it again. He contrasts. It's the structure of the passage. He's giving you a contrast, contrast. In 7 and 8, contrast and contrast. He's giving you contrast. What's he saying in verse 7 and 8? Jesus is saying you can have your prayers to a little g God You can offer your prayers to a little g God in verse 7 who desperately needs you to fill him in with what you need and what's going on and you need him to tell you, he needs you to tell him so that you can help him get your goals. Get what you want. You can have that little g God who desperately needs you or you can have almighty God, El Shaddai, who knows everything, who sees everything, who hears everything, even when it's not even audible, who doesn't need your help one bit to take perfect care of you. You can have him. What's Jesus doing here? Which one you want? Which one you want? That's what Jesus is saying in verse 7. When when you pray like verse 7, you pray like God is weak. Pray instead like you are weak. You pray like verse 7, God is weak. Jesus says pray instead like you are weak. Because you are. Pray like God is mighty. Because he is. Pray like God is the thrice holy, omnipotent God who holds all things together by a simple word of his power. Pray like God is one who created all things and sustains all things. Pray like God is like that because he is. Pray, Father, I need you. I need you so badly. I need you so desperately. And I have you. No, actually, Lord, you have me. You have me. So hold me, Father. Hold me fast. I'm I'm struggling. If left up to myself, I know my weakness. I know I will return to the vomit and I'll stay there. I'll just waller and just eat it up. If it was me. But if it's you, if you got me, you won't let me stay. You'll keep bringing me back. You're a good father. I need you. I'm so weak, but you, Father, are so strong. And you beat your breast, cry out to God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And then look at the finished work of Jesus and see that he's done just that. He's been merciful to you because there is more mercy in this God in Jesus Christ than there is any sin in you if you come to him in faith. So which way are you going to pray? Which way are you going to pray? Beloved, this is why prayer is so vital. It's why it matters so much. Because you desperately need God. I desperately need God. I need and you need the author and sustainer of your faith to help you, to carry you, to hold you. And this is the wonder of wonders. He promises to do that. He promises to do that. He sent his son to seal the deal. And then he sent his Holy Spirit as a guarantee. You're mine forever. So if you read verse 8, Look in verse 8. And if you're wondering, if God knows what I need already, then why do I need to pray? If that's what you're asking, beloved children of God, I plead with you, ask that question no more. You can ask it once, that's great. But know from here on, 
what Jesus has just taught you. Since God already knows what you need, prayer isn't about informing God. Prayer isn't about reminding God. It's about God informing you. It's about God reminding you who He is and what He's done. It doesn't mean we don't bring our, cast our cares upon Him. We finish the sentence though. Cast your cares upon Him because He cares for you. Reminding you who He is. Prayer is not about informing God, but God informing you, about God reminding you. Which, by the way, is why we should pray the scriptures more often. We're going to talk more about that next week, Lord willing. About how to pray, but pray according to the scriptures. Because you need God to remind you who He is. and How has how is he, he told you already? Right here. But more on that next week. So, so that's... That's the why of prayer. Number one, if you're born again, you think of a newborn baby coming out of the womb, what's the, what's the symptom that the baby is alive? We talked about this in children's Sunday school today. Children, tell me, what's the symptom that the baby is alive when they come out of the womb? They cry. Extra points, bro. Um, they cry out. In the same way, the Christian yearns to cry out to their heavenly Father. I want to commune with him. I I need you. I need. That's number one. It's evidence of being regenerated. Number two, prayer matters because of who you're praying to. You get to spend time with God, your creator and sustainer, and your reward is more of him. Number three, prayer matters because that same creator and sustainer whom you desperately need promises to help you. So pray. I just want to urge us. Pray. Pray, beloved. Let's give ourselves to prayer. I mean, just think about, just like my daughter at the first thought of pain, at the thought of her mother's sickness, just her first instinct was to bring it before the Lord. How could we not look at the sickness amongst us, at the lostness in this community, at the lostness in the world? It just it seems like just horrible things going on. It just seems... We are in desperate need of revival. We're in desperate need of the Holy Spirit to come do a work that we definitely can't do ourselves. We're just so needy. And if my three-year-old unconverted daughter can feel that way, how can we not look in our own lives, corporately here and outside, and not long and just yearn to give these things to the Lord? So I I want to encourage us all to pray like the old hymn. You know this hymn? What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and grief to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. I want to ask you the question, how can we as a body claim to believe all that God is in this holy book and yet practice functional agnosticism, maybe even atheism in our practice by the way we neglect to pray to the one who knows all that we need before we even ask? Do you practice practical agnosticism by the way you don't pray is our body guilty of practicing practical agnosticism or atheism because we don't pray how can we say we believe this if we don't then commune with the God of this word how how, how can we as a body survive if we go on having um how, how can we as a body survive if we, if we go on having not because we've asked not? We can't. We can't. So in the weeks to come, the, the elders 
want to propose um, that we as a body give ourselves more regularly to prayer. It is the elders' hope that this congregation would um, be so um, full of a desire to, to do things God's way that we would give ourselves to just once a month, maybe sometime starting in March, regular prayer meetings, coming together in an evening once a month and saying, here are the things that we want to bring before the Lord. We know He knows them already, but we need His help. That would be a good thing, wouldn't it? There's reasons to do that. Unless you think, right, that, uh, well, if we pray together, we're going to go against Jesus' word because He says, you know, don't pray um, that others would hear you. Well, hold on just a second. That same, uh, that same man, the God-man, prayed in front of others too. What's Jesus talking about here? He's not talking about it's, it's unbiblical or unrighteous or sinful to pray with each other. But that's actually commanded in Scripture in multiple places. Let me just give you a couple. Acts 12, 12. Many, it says, were gathered together, together to pray. Colossians 4, 2. Devote yourselves, it's in the plural, together corporately as a church to prayer. Romans 12, 12. It has a list of all kinds of things to do together. And in the list, in the midst of all these things that you're supposed to do together with one another, it lists prayer. Uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 24. Remember the apostles get together to replace Judas. And what do they do before they replace Judas? They pray together. Right? Jesus himself at the tomb of Lazarus, what does he do? He prays out loud. I mean, one could go on and on. We, we must pray. And we must pray alone in our, in our prayer closets, beside our beds, when we rise, when we fall, and we also must pray together with our families, with one another as a church. This would be right to do. I mean, look at all these reasons to pray. Jesus isn't saying here that it's wrong to pray out loud in the midst of others. It's saying it's wrong to do that when your motivation's wrong. We're going to look more at that next week, Lord willing, of what it looks like to pray together and by ourselves. There are reasons upon reasons. There are three of them to do this. But I would ask that you would consider in the days and months ahead how we as a body, going into 2023, could give ourselves to practicing righteousness rightly by doing things God's way, God's way, to giving ourselves to what matters to God, which is prayer. We desperately need it. Amen? Let's do that. Let's, let's consider giving ourselves to that together and individually. Let's pray together to that end right now. Our Father, who is in heaven, we ask that your name would be hallowed. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We thank you for the fact that you gave us this day our daily bread and that you've forgiven us our trespasses, our sins, in response to that, we ask that we would forgive those in this body and those outside this body for the sins that they have committed against us. Lord, we ask that you would not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And we're so thankful you promised to do so. For yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power and the glory forever. We praise you. We pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Musicians, if you'd come.